Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Great Panther Mining stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Great Panther Mining is a producer of gold, silver, lead, and zinc. It owns a diversified portfolio of assets in Brazil, Mexico, and Peru. That includes three operating mines. The company became a metal producer in 2006 after a restructuring when its new CEO acquired several dormant mines in Mexico. After the company brought two mines back into production, its stock graduated to the TSX. Over the years, the company has grown its portfolio through mergers and acquisitions. The company is proud to say it has had no significant environmental incidents. They paid over $19 million to various governments to help support and improve the communities it operates in. Each employee receives 20 hours of training to make sure they are safe and they do their part to limit the negative impact mining can do to each community. Just to give you a little background on the types of mining companies, there are two types, the junior and the senior. The junior miner is called the exploration company. It raises money from investors or other mining companies to conduct feasibility studies and identify gold, copper, etc. Once they complete the exploration process and if they deduce the mineral deposits in that location can generate more money in the open market than it costs to dig up, then it sells the rights to the location to a senior miner. There are some junior miners, including this one, that operates the mines to try to monetize their business and grow it that way. It is much riskier investing in a junior miner because 99% of the time they go bankrupt before identifying anything. The flip side is when they are successful, the stock blows up and can 10, 20, or 30 extra money. The best way to find a quality junior miner is to try to learn about the company's projects by understanding the grade of the metal how many tons of it are available, and where it is located. The mines need to be in a safe area with little political interference. You need to be able to get to the location ideally by driving, and your workers need access to water, power, etc. The company we're talking about is a junior miner. Let's talk about the senior mining company. A senior miner has lots of experience, is well capitalized, and is actively mining different commodities and selling them. To value a senior miner, you need to look at the projects it has and the amount of potential metal it can pull from those projects and gauge the future price of those commodities. When you invest in a commodity-linked company like a miner, the company is at the mercy of the market price of the commodity. You can do all the analysis in the world but if you are invested in a gold mining company and the price of gold drops 70%, the stock will tank. This is a picture of its mines in Brazil, Peru, and Mexico. Its 2021 projection for these mines is to produce 120,000 to 130,000 ounces of gold. The company is headquartered in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada and was founded in 2003. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange, TSX, Deutsche Börse, and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a micro cap company, 158 million market cap. They're trading at 44 cents a share, and they have 357 million shares outstanding. We're going to look at the ticker that trades in the U.S., since the company reports all their financials in U.S. dollars. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video and free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they finally had positive free cash flow for the first time in 2020, a small positive in the trailing 12 months. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That was negative in 18 and 19, positive in 2020 and the trailing 12 months. Revenue is a sales for the company and that went up a lot from 59 million up to 250 million. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Here's a breakdown of their 2020 revenue. They sold 132,000 ounces of gold and 1.1 million ounces of silver. So as you know, gold is a lot more expensive. 
In dollar terms, most of the revenue is in gold at 236 million, 23 million in silver. They sold a small amount of lead and zinc. This line down here, AU, EQ, OZ, this is gold equivalent. The way to calculate this, you take your total ounces of gold, then you add the ounces of silver, but you convert that to gold dollars. You can see this mine didn't produce much silver, only 24,000 ounces. So the gold equivalent was just a little more than the gold ounces. But in Topia, they sold a lot of silver. When you convert that silver to gold dollars, it will be the same as selling 10,900 ounces of gold. In 2018, their revenue was 59 million. In 2019, it was 200 million. But the price of gold was pretty similar in both years. They just sold a lot more gold in 2019 when compared to 2018. They didn't sell much more gold in 2020 or the first half of 2021. The reason their revenue went up so much is because the price of gold went up so much. If the price of gold gets really low, like below $1,000 an ounce, some companies don't sell any gold. They mine it, but they store it and wait for gold prices to go up. When gold prices get high like they are now, then all the gold miners take the gold out of their reserves and try to sell it. So the market gets flooded with people trying to sell gold at the higher prices. And what happens when supply gets really high? The price comes down. So it's a vicious cycle. You want to sell all your gold when the prices are high, but if you do sell all your gold, then it pushes the prices lower. Supply and demand economics is connected to every industry, but commodity industries, it's much more severe. Because in other industries, you could pick your price. If you make your product that much better than your competitor, your customer may be willing to pay more. But when you sell a commodity, it doesn't matter where you get it from, everybody's selling the same thing. Of course, there's different grades of gold and different grades of any commodity. But if somebody's selling the same grade, they can't sell it for even $1 more than their competitor because everybody would go to the competitor. But when Apple makes an iPhone, that's such a unique product. And if sales get really high, they can make more, they can raise the price until that supply demand curve meets and they maximize their profits. It's just a little more nuanced when looking at gold. It's an interesting topic that we should talk about on a live stream. Below revenue is a cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The cost to pull the metals, the cost of labor and depreciation are all part of cost of revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. That peaked in 2020, but it is positive every year. Below that is our operating expenses. Payroll, rent, insurance, and depreciation are all examples of operating expenses. Expenses could be in multiple buckets. Payroll could be in cost of revenue. The payroll for the people working at the mines. The payroll for the CEO, the CEO's assistant, or the account, that's all part of operating expenses. Same thing with depreciation. Depending on what that product is, it might fall into cost of revenue. It might fall into operating expenses. Below that is their operating income. And they had the highest operating income in 2020 at 57 million. It was 36 million in the trailing 12 months. They paid 3.9 million of interest on their debt, which was lower than 2019, but a lot higher than 2018. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. And the reason their net income is so low in 2020 is because of this large write-off of 49 million. When a company has a lot of fixed assets, they tend to pass through write-offs. So if the value of the asset goes down, they'll decrease it on the balance sheet and pass through a loss onto the income statement. Or sometimes they sell some assets and they pass through a gain onto the income statement. So that's why I would just focus on operating income when looking at the income statement. That's a better indicator of how the company's doing. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash. Because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. They do generate positive operating cash flow every year. Even though they had negative net income in 2018 and 19, they passed through so much depreciation that's a non-cash item, so you add it back on the statement of cash flows. 
They've been spending more each year in PP&E, that's capital expenditures. When they buy the rights to a mine or equipment to use at the mine, that's all part of CapEx. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they do have positive free cash flow in 2020 and the trailing 12 months. So that looks really good. They did have negative in 2018 and 19, but their revenue was a lot lower in those years. They added 16 million of stock in 2019. When a company adds stock, that dilutes the current shareholders and makes your shares less valuable. And it looks like they're paying down debt every year. They pay more debt each year than they issue. This is the equity section of their balance sheet. They have 107 million of equity. They raised 270 million from selling their business and they lost 179 million from running their business. Now that they're becoming profitable, they may have positive retained earnings in the next two or three years because retained earnings is a sum of all your prior net incomes. Let's look at the capital structure. They have 107 million of equity, 38 million of debt. They're 74% equity, 26% debt. Their net debt is 3 million and their WAC is 9%. That's the middle WAC on Finbox. And that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for. That's 427 million. We discounted those numbers back to today's new weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $371 million. We divide that by 357 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 104. They're trading at 44 cents, so they're trading at a 57% discount. It's a strong buy according to the model. The average analyst projects their revenue to grow 18.2%. To calculate their future revenue, I just grew at 18.2% for the next four years. And to calculate their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So I summed up these two free cash flow numbers, that's 28. I divided by these two revenue numbers, that's 511. And that comes out to 5.5%. So I multiplied their future revenue by 5.5%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. Simply, Wall Street values the company at 2 cents. So they're saying it's extremely overvalued. Three analysts priced this stock and the average price target was 123. The low was 70 cents, the high was 225. This stock was trading at $5 10 years ago. So when people bought this stock 10 years ago, that's way before the company was generating much revenue. So they were waiting a long time, hoping the stock price would go up and they would get a good return. It did come down a lot in 2015. It came back up to over $2. The beginning of this year was over $1 and the stock price has been cut in half. Now you have a lot more information than people did five, 10 years ago. The company is profitable now, so there is a good chance a stock will go up. This is a pretty volatile stock. It has a beta of 1.97, so the stock moves two times to market. It's gone down 47% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 39%. The 52-week low is 42 cents, the high is 116, and the stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. It's pretty much trading on its lowest point right now in the past 52 weeks. One and a half million shares are traded each day on this stock. Pretty much all the shares outstanding are on float. 18% are held by institutions and 1% of the shares are shorted. A good sign is that the company is hiring employees. They now pay 787 people. Their employee count jumped a lot from 2019 to 2020. If you put $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd be at $1,800 today. That's an 82% loss. Pretty much any time you bought the stock in the past 10 years, you probably would have lost money because it's trading almost at its all-time low. Back in August, the CEO of the company, Robert Henderson, bought 20,000 shares at 47 cents each. If you buy shares now, you're getting a better deal than the CEO of the company. In June, the head of HR bought 7,000 shares at 70 cents each. On that same day, she sold 3,900 shares. And Robert Henderson bought 43,000 shares in January at 80 cents each. So on these two trades from January, he's down 50%. Neil Hepworth sold 84,000 shares, 68 cents each, which is equivalent to $57,000. Neil Hepworth was mentioned in their presentation. He's an expert in this field. He helped this company with the scientific and technical information to prepare their reports. So it looks like he was paid in stock 
and he turned around and sold the stock right away. The biggest shareholder is Vanek at 6%, then Ruffer 3%, Murray Asset Management, Donald Smith, and Renaissance Technologies. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have really good price multiples. Since their stock price has come down so much, they have a PE of 7.2, a price to sales of 0.6, and a price to book of 1.5. So as your market cap comes down, your price multiples appear a lot more attractive. They have a really high return on invested capital of 28%. They can cover their interest payments nine times, and they have a solid ROE at 20%. They have a current ratio of 1.1 and a quick ratio of 0.8. They have 35 million of cash on their balance sheet, 18 million of receivables, and 30 million of inventory. So they seem to be in good shape because now they have positive free cash flow so they can pay their bills. Plus they have 10 million of working capital. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 11 companies in the same industry as GPL. And if GPL has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. They have amazing price multiples, much better than the average. Their current ratio is fine. They have a solid ROE. Their debt is same as the average, 26%. And they're by far the smallest company on this list. And of course, they don't pay a dividend, but they might pay a dividend in two or three years. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 57% discount. And this company looks like an amazing buy. You want to just learn about their minds a little more, but I don't get into that type of detail because I just don't have that expertise. I'm much more comfortable with the numbers. And it looks like they're putting up great numbers. I rank their free cash flows 3 out of 10, their revenue 4 out of 10, and their ratios 10 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.